this episode of the Rockford Files is actually a meetup kind of presentation that I did not too long ago, all about how to maybe deal with elbow tendonitis, whether it's tennis elbow or golfer's elbow. Most likely, it is how the joints are relating to one another, not simply the elbow, but perhaps the hips, the shoulders, the spine, all the way down to the feet. And we're going to look at joint relationships to see if we can't help that elbow out. I hope you enjoy it. And I'm Rocky Snyder, and I've got a movement studio in Santa Cruz County in California on the central coast here. And today, in today's meetup, somewhere down the road, it will be in person, I swear. It sure would be nice to get that going on again. But I'm the only one in my studio right now, which means that I don't have to have my mask on. But all other times, well, we wear the mask. So somewhere down the road, we will do this in person. But today, we're going to do a meetup. It's the first Saturday of the month. And so that's what we do. First Saturday of the month, typically, we'll be dealing with some issues of movement, issues in the tissues, as I sometimes like to call it, and also sports activities. But today, we're going to be dealing with the elbow. And... In some ways, we won't be dealing with the elbow. We'll be dealing with the rest of the body and see if we can't make that elbow feel better by inviting friends to the party, so to speak. So lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, that's what is the official term for tennis and golfer's elbow, respectively. I guess we should probably look at that a little bit. It is the inflammation of tendinous tissue surrounding the elbow, either it's on the inside or the outside. And curious, if you're, if you're kind of in the audience, then most likely you know somebody or you yourself have been troubled by such things. And it's been a, probably a little bit of a, a headache for you or, or, of course, elbow ache, but it's probably restricted you from doing the things that you enjoy doing. So maybe we can get to the underlying reasons as to why that elbow is behaving the way it is, because it's definitely, there you go, and it's definitely going to be behaving based on how the rest of the body is. Conventional approaches are going to be a little different than what we're going to do today. And I say that because when you tr get trouble in a tendon and there's, there's an area that becomes, say, aggravated, it makes sense that that area will be inflamed. More of the, the um, fluids of your body will be traveling to an area to inflame it so that it, it restricts movement. So that is a natural way of trying to deal with issues in a, in, around a joint is, well, if we make it so that it can move less, maybe that can help in the healing process. So inflammation is actually part of the healing process. We go to, say, a traditional physician and get attention on the elbow. And of course, that's where they focus on because that's where your pain is. And they'll say, well, it's inflamed. So we're going to immobilize it. We're going to keep it from moving, but we're going to give you anti-inflammatories. So you got to kind of scratch your head at that going, well, if the natural response and process of healing is to create inflammation, to bring fluids there and circulation, why are we trying to reduce it? And to, to my knowledge, I'm not quite sure. That's why I scratch my head about it. We definitely know that movement is a key in, in getting things to feel better. So we're not going to necessarily ask the elbow to, to not do its fair share. We're just going to get all the other areas to do its fair share. So the doctor will give you anti-inflammatories and they'll tell you, okay, well, let's put ice on it. Now, if it is something that's traumatic, that is right away that needs ice, that's probably not a bad idea. But when it comes to joint pain and, and things like this, I don't know of too many people that when they get to retirement age, they say, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Greenland because there's plenty of ice there for my body, right? No, people go to Florida and to the Palm Desert, into Mexico or wherever in the southern regions where it's a lot warmer and their joints feel better. So then you got to go, wow, maybe there's something to that. Maybe I don't have to rely quite so much on ice. Maybe in the future, I can think about what is it like to warm that area up. All right. So the elbow, just taking it for what it is. It is a joint that is meant to basically flex and extend. 
Now it can rotate, interestingly enough, here quite a bit. The radius and the ulna will almost cross each other in some ways when we rotate back and forth. So it's a hinge and it's not necessarily a ball and socket, but it does have a lot of rotational aspect to it. Uh, the wrist, meanwhile, has a lot of movement, very similar to a ball and socket. And of course, the shoulder has all these sorts of movements. And if we could think about how much movement each of these joints could perform ideally, and maybe give them a certain percentage, like, well, the shoulder's a big joint. Maybe when it comes to upper body action, they do a higher percentage of motion than say the wrist, which is a smaller kind of joint. And the elbow, even though it does some rotation, it doesn't do it like the shoulder. So maybe there's less there. Well, what happens if I've been typing on a keyboard all day or driving all day, or I am just not very active and my shoulder just starts to get less movement? Well, then the body is going to adapt to that and it's going to restrict movement in an area that's meant for it. And then I'm gonna go out to the golf course or to the tennis court, and I'm going to try and play with a shoulder that I don't realize it, but unbeknownst to me is not as fluid and moving, moving as it should be. And every time I take a forehand or a backhand or a downstroke or whatever, that shoulder is not participating to the percentage it should. It has decreased maybe by 2%, maybe 5%, who knows? That means that I have to make it up somewhere else. I always have to get to 100% in order to achieve the, the movement I'm desiring. So if this is reducing, then wouldn't it make sense for somewhere else, maybe a neighboring joint, to start to participate more, more than it was designed to. And that increase in load, movement, repetitions, starts to aggravate an area that was not meant to handle that much action. So the elbow, maybe, just maybe, starts to be one of those areas to compensate. And that compensatory pattern over time and over repetition after repetition becomes irritated. And therefore the irritation brings about the immune system's way of healing it, which brings inflammation. And the next thing you know, you're starting to go, ooh, that kind of bothers me a little bit here. And you start to kind of put a little pressure and that relieves it maybe. Or you start wearing a neoprene sleeve to keep warmth in the area, but also to kind of, kind of protect it in a way, to give you some kind of mental idea that something's not quite right there and I have to be careful. These are all good ideas, but wouldn't it be nice to get to the heart of the matter? So here's some questions that I would like to pose to all of you. One in particular, what happened before this happened? Something had to occur to change the way in which you move. Now it could not, it may not be related to your elbow. It may not be related to that arm. It may not be the shoulder. Could it be that you wrenched a knee, which changed the way in which you had to organize movement when you walked or played? And that would shift weight away from an injured area, asking other areas to work harder, maybe causing certain places to shorten or restrict their movement in a way of protecting and therefore creating more work and compensation elsewhere. So if you were to think about when this elbow issue began, can you think of anything that might have occurred before that happened? And we're not talking a day, it could be a week, months, could be several years. In fact, it could be when you were just a child and it's taken this long for something like this to occur. But every injury, every accident, every surgery, heck, even emotional episodes and upheavals could change the way your posture is. And if it stays that way, then it's gonna change how you move your body. So it's just something to, you might want to just jot down some notes and kind of think about, well, what's been happening? Did you have a pulled hamstring? And then the hamstring felt better. And now you're chasing the pain through your body. Well, then my neck started wrenching up, but the neck feels better. Now my elbow's bugging me. Does anybody feel like pain is just traveling from one place of your body to the other? And yet, did anybody hit their elbow? Did you actually have trauma to the joint where you're complaining, where the body's complaining. Because if you haven't had a traumatic 
blunt force applied to that area, then it's more of a movement kind of thing, structural or movement. So we're gonna look at that today. Generally, we chat for about maybe 10 to 20 minutes and then we're gonna go up and explore. And what I'd like to do is we're not going to, first of all, hunt down pain. I don't want you to try and find it if it starts to get alleviated or in the best case scenario, if it just disappears entirely. Your goal is not to disbelieve your body or the things that we're going through. It's, it's more about, okay, let's just feel what the movement in the elbow is like. Do I have, when is it that I feel the action aggravate that area? Is it on my backhand, my forehand? Is it on my downswing, my backstroke, whatever it is? You might want to just mimic that a little bit and get a feeling of what does that feel like? And then we're gonna do a movement and then you're going to reassess just to see if maybe that movement helped. We're gonna take it in a logical progression. And then we'll do another movement and we'll reassess and see if that helped. And the goal here is to go through maybe about eight or nine movements and see if may, maybe some of these you can apply on a regular basis to help you out. Now, there is about 10 people in this group right now and that means that there's probably going to be 10 different outcomes, which will also mean that there's probably a combination of movements that are going to be good for one person, but not for another person. So this is all about finding what is good for your individual body and the way you move. And can we bring about a more positive result than what you're experiencing now? So we're going to look at shoulder range of motion, because that makes sense. If your shoulder is restricted, then maybe it's asking the elbow to do too much. We're also gonna look at the hips a little bit because everything's connected. And if the hips are restricted, it may be asking the shoulders to do more. And if those shoulders are doing more, they may get restricted also. But uh, we also may look at the opposite knee of the elbow that you're encountering because interestingly enough, when we were primitive on all fours, the elbow was actually a knee. And my right elbow and my left knee had this beautiful relationship that has been in existence for millions of years, hardwired into our nervous system. So is there anybody out there right now that notices that if it's your right elbow, do you have any issues with your left knee? Or if it's your left elbow, do you have any issues with your right knee? Just kind of, just kind of a curious thought that you might want to explore. So if we got the need to move better, Maybe it might give permission for its opposing relative, the opposite elbow, to feel a little bit better also. Ah. Okay, if you have questions as we go along, what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, is go ahead and type them into the chat below. And at the end, we'll field those questions and kind of walk through it. And also at the end, we can unmute all the mics and we can have little discussions. But Let's get right into it. Let's, let's get into assessing the, the elbow and the shoulder. How about that? So let's start with the elbow and just get a sense of what does it feel like to flex at the elbow and extend it. And let's do it with the palm up, flexing and extending. And when you extend the elbow, you can incorporate a little bit of arm action at the shoulder. What does that feel like? Okay. And then the elbow, what does it feel like to bring the hand outward and inward? So at the shoulder, we're externally and internally rotating. And what is it like to go from palm down to palm up? So now we're internally and externally rotating the elbow. Just get a feel for that. Any issues with that motion? may want to try and do a little bit of an arm circle with the elbow where the I'm just supporting myself underneath the elbow. I'm going to try and bring my fist right toward my face, straighten out the elbow, flip the palm up, bring it to the outside, and again, right to my chin and bring it on down. Try a few of those and then change directions, extending out in front of you, flipping downward, bring it to the chin, out away from the body and back on in. Any of those movements start to talk to you. Do they irritate the elbow? 
Um, just curious. We can do the same thing on the other arm. What is it like to flex and extend the arm? Palm up, palm down. What is it like to bring it inward and outward? Rotate the palm down and up and making circles in one direction and in the opposite. All I'm interested to know is, is there a difference between the arms? Is one feeling more agitated? Is one free flowing? Hmm. Let's do this then. Let's get into the shoulder. Now the shoulder from profile, we're gonna keep the elbow out of the motion. So can you keep the elbow straight? Because I'm more interested in the motion of the shoulder. And what I'm going to ask you to do is just bring your arm up and overhead and get a sense of when does it feel like work to raise the arm? When do you get a little restricted? And can you keep your torso kind of upright and not have to lean back to bring your arm up higher? Check with the other arm. What is that like? Are you able to keep your elbow straight as you come up? Or do you find that it starts to bend and go off to the side? Does it stay extended at the elbow when you do this? Probably not bad that you have a screen in front of you and you can see your image right there. But if you have a mirror, that could work too. So we just assessed your flexion of your shoulder. Did one feel more restricted than the other? And does it happen to be the same side as the elbow that's troubling you? Then let's take your palms face forward and with the elbow straight, one arm at a time will come up from the side and overhead. This is known as abducting and adducting the shoulder. And what does that feel like? Keeping the elbow straight, are you able to achieve that? And then compare it to the other shoulder. Do you notice any subtle or not so subtle difference between these two movements? And lastly, we'll do both these at the same time, focusing on the crease of the, the pit of the elbow here, the inside of that elbow. What is it like to turn those inward and turn them outward? Do you feel like that both shoulders are moving forward and upward in this direction? Do they do that evenly? And then as you turn the elbows outward or arms outward, do the shoulders drop? Just different movements. Now, the interesting thing is if you just did these assessments of movement, you may actually start to create a better usage of the shoulder, which would reduce the need for compensation and irritation of the elbow, which is exactly what we're going to do with these movements, is we're going to remind the shoulders and the hips and other areas what they're meant to do. And then we're going to see if that has a positive effect on the elbow. So let's do the first movement here. And then I want you to reassess any area that I don't want you to try and drive more irritation, but go ahead and check out your elbow and see if it's when you pick up something like a coffee cup or a can or your racket or club, or if it's when you have a particular movement. I don't want you to try and drive into the pain, but we do want to check to see if there's any change. So with the first movement, we're going to call it lateral raises. You're going to have your arms down by your side. Your elbows will stay stiff and straight. We do not want the elbows to do any of this particular movement. It should be coming from the shoulders. We'll raise the arms up to shoulder height. And then we're going to rotate the entire arm, elbow, wrist, hand, shoulder, so that the palms face upward. And you're going to continue to raise the arms up overhead until the fingertips touch, hopefully, keeping the elbows straight the entire time. Rotate down to shoulder height or lower to shoulder height, and then rotate the arms downward until you get back to your thighs. That's one repetition. What we're gonna try and do it are 10 repetitions. So where I focus my attention when doing this is on my elbow so that I know that it's staying straight, but I also feel that the crease of my elbow must rotate upward. So it tells me that I'm rotating through my shoulder. Continue with this motion while I kind of continue with the instruction. So the arm stays straight. We rotate through the shoulder, bringing the arm up overhead. 
and then we rotate through the shoulder to bring it back down. Up to shoulder height, rotate, come up and touch. Now you can do this in a seated position. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, by doing it seated, we'll take the legs out of it, making it a lot more focused or concentrated on the upper body. I could do it kneeling on both knees, which would pretty much do the same. Take out a lot of my lower body and rely much more on the shoulders to do this work. Let's do maybe two more. And be very precise with your motion. Having the arms parallel at shoulder height and back down. Okay, check in with your elbow. Just see, is it starting to feel different? If it's feeling a little bit better, I want you to write down this movement onto a piece of paper. Make, jot down a little note. If this was something that felt like it was benefiting your elbow in that symptom, because your elbow is not bad, first of all. Like while you're writing notes, I'm gonna banter on with this. Anybody that comes to me and say they've got a bad this or a bad that, this is my bad side or my bad elbow. Unless it ran away with the the minister's wife to like some some slopes in the Alps and left you and the kids at home, I'm going to say that's a completely different scenario. That would be a bad side, right? But the elbow is probably like a wounded warrior. It has been trying to do so much in place of somewhere else. So consider that. It's not bad. It's a hero. And it's, it's just wounded. It needs a little bit of help and encouragement. It's a good thing. And it, it's probably, it's screaming out to let you know something's not quite right. So it's kind of like letting you, letting you know that we need to be doing something. Okay, so this next movement is again, all about getting the shoulders to move properly. We can do it in a couple of ways. One is by keeping the arms relaxed. And we're gonna try and do a circular motion at the shoulder. So I could simply do shoulder rolls or more to the point they'd be like squares. So I'm going to draw my shoulders back lift them up, separate them, and drop them down. So I can have this kind of action going on in a forward manner. And then I could do the same thing in a backward manner. However, if, if that's the way that you'd like to do it, then go ahead and do about 10 repetitions forward and be very precise. Don't just think that you're doing it right. Actually be aware, bring some awareness in your body. Do you really pull the shoulders back? Can they come up evenly? Can you separate them? And can you drop them down? Or do you find that you're bending your elbows instead of moving through your shoulders? Can you keep your arms pretty straight and relaxed while you're doing this? Now, the next way of doing it or more modified or intense way is to get your arms out by your side with your elbows straight. And I'm gonna curl my fingers in just to take them out of the equation. My wrists are gonna be straight. My elbows are extended and they're staying straight. And I'm going to make circles, maybe six inches in diameter with my arms. So from a profile, we hope to see that the arms are right by my side, out away from my body. And I'll feel like my shoulder blades are being pinched together ever so subtly. And I'm gonna go for maybe about 10 or 20 circles in this direction. I'm gonna make sure that those elbows don't get soft and have this kind of action going on. Cause you can see that now my wrist and elbows are doing the work and there's very little motion in my shoulders. So keeping the wrists and elbows rigid and getting the work to be performed in the shoulders will instantly start to awaken those muscles. Now, for those with your arms by your side, reverse directions. And for those with your arms out like mine, flip the palms over and continue in a circular direction backwards, leading at the top of the circle. So in a way, the thumbs point the direction that we're going, keeping those arms out by your side. Does this feel like a little bit of work to you? If this is starting to get fatiguing around the arms and shoulders, what does that tell you about those muscles in their contribution on a regular basis? It may be that we need to wake them up a little bit more. Okay, so those are arm circles or shoulder rolls. Check in with your elbow now. How's it feeling? Is it more irritated than before? less irritated, or is there no difference whatsoever? Probably one of those three. If it's feeling a little bit better, 
then go ahead and write arm circles or shoulder rolls into your personalized program. So far, so good. And at no point in time have we actually asked the elbows to do much. We haven't really stretched them out. We haven't done anything with them. We're just trying to bring some friends to the party. So this time, instead of keeping the arms straight at the elbows, we are gonna ask them, ask them to bend. And I'm gonna curl my fingers in so that my first two knuckles, my index finger and middle finger knuckles, will be placed against the soft tissue outside my eyes. So right up against the temples. Now my palms will be facing forward with my thumbs pointed downward as those knuckles rest against my temples and my arms are out away from my body. And all we're gonna try and do is keep the wrist straight as we draw the elbows toward each other and then come back out again. Now, for some of you, you might find this really challenging and you get only to about here and then just go on back. But don't worry, we're patient. We will continue to do this until all elbows contact each other. So you just gotta really work this. Now, there's many ways to cheat or to find other ways of doing it in order to get the elbows to touch. I might find that people lean back to bring the arms forward. If you're one of those, if you find your head driving back, you might wanna try lay, standing against a wall so that you can't push into, push back, but your head, shoulders, and hips are resting against that wall. So in the previous movements, we have taught the shoulders how to properly move away from the body or midline, known as abducting and moving toward the midline, adducting. We have done circular patterns. So we've reminded the shoulder that they are a ball and socket like action that can internally and externally rotate as well as create circular patterns. And now we're teaching the shoulders that, that they're meant to be hinges like on a door frame where the door is shut and open. All right. By doing that, you should feel like those shoulder blades began gliding and kind of getting thawed off of the rib cage because more often than not, with all the arm action forward, a lot of times the shoulder blade gets plastered against the rib cage and doesn't glide very well, which puts more strain on the shoulder, which may ask the elbow to do more work. So now let's reassess. How does that elbow feel? What is the motion like? Is it feeling okay when you come down or when you come around? When is it? Is that feeling a little bit better? Could it be just by getting those shoulder blades to glide and open up the shoulders? Things are feeling better. If it is, then those elbow touches, it's what we call these, are great to have in your library of, of happy elbows. Okay. Next on the list, we're gonna try and get both arms to work together as well as work in opposition. So we're going to work on this spiral-like action with the arms internally and externally rotating them. And we're gonna try and incorporate a chain reaction through the entire body if possible. And we're going to feed that chain reaction through the action of our arms. So as you internally rotate the arms, do you get a sense that the shoulders wanna go forward? Please allow them to if that's what you're feeling. And if you don't feel like the shoulders going forward, see if you can just encourage them to move forward a little bit, kind of rounding the shoulders. And then as you externally rotate the arms, feel how that draws the shoulders back. As the arms internally rotate, not only do the shoulders go forward, but can you get a sense that they're going upward slightly toward your jaw? Allow that to happen. And as you externally rotate the arms, not only do they go backwards, but they should go downward. So can you create this motion of forward and upward with the shoulders when we internally rotate and back down and behind you as you externally rotate? Internal rotation, forward and upward, external rotation downward. So as those shoulders continue their journey with the arms spiraling, what happens to the rib cage or your sternum, the chest? Do you feel how it drops down when the arms roll inward? and how it lifts up when they roll outward. 
can you encourage that to happen without being too forceful? And as we're continuing with this, can you keep the head nice and level? So if you were had a cup of water on the top of your head, it would stay there. So now in order for me to keep that head level with the chest dropping down, I actually have to kind of lift my chin. And then as the arms wind outward and the chest lifts up, my chin have, has to almost tuck toward my chest. All right. So that's just a chain reaction with both arms going at the same time. Check in again with the elbow. More irritation, less irritation, no change. If there's less, great. Start to practice that. Then we're going to move on to arms out at your side at shoulder height. One arm is going to turn internally. So the palm goes downward and behind you. While the other palm does the opposite, it goes upward. And then we reverse directions. So the elbow is gonna bend slightly with this motion on one arm when it goes palm up, but when it goes in the opposite direction and internally rotates, the elbow is going to want to extend and straighten. Almost looking Egyptian here, going side to side with these opposing actions, but this is creating almost a wash rag effect on the tissues connecting one hand across to the other. As the palm flips downward, the shoulder goes forward and drives the head away almost. And as that palm goes back upward, it almost draws the head in that direction while the shoulder dips down. Can you keep the head in one location and level while moving through this? And what you may experience is lengthening along the neck. Could it be that some of that tissue is restricting, connecting to the shoulder, restricting shoulder action, and encouraging the elbow to do more? So if we get the shoulders and the neck to start to unlock, what might that mean for the elbow? All right, rest after those. Arm spirals. Check in again. My elbow is feeling really nice. It didn't have anything going on with it, but even then, Without any complaint, I can still feel like these are actually opening up some things. So those are shoulder actions, right? We, again, we haven't dealt with the elbow. We're not gonna ice it down or warm it up or stretch it out. That's not the purpose of today, is to explore other areas that may contribute to the elbow, such as the hips and the lats. So this is the first time we actually brought in a muscle. I've been talking about joints up until this point, but the lat muscle is something we may want to consider. It's the one muscle that attaches the arm to my mid back, my lower back and my pelvis. It's the only muscle that does that. So from a structural standpoint, from a movement standpoint, it could be that if I'm restricted in my lats, it could be drawing down on my shoulder, making it less of able to move freely, making the elbow work harder. So let's do a lat stretch for the sake of it. I am going to use this cable system behind me because it just happens to be conveniently located for me. For you, you might want to try and grab onto a door frame or something that's high up on a wall that's not going to move anywhere. Maybe the top of a refrigerator, that might be it. Anything that you can reach up overhead. I'm using my right arm and I'm holding on with the right hand to this cable system. I'm going to be facing perpendicular from where that object is. I do not want my arm to be in front of my head because that will create rotation that I'm not interested in achieving right now. But I want to keep my arm nestled right almost against my ear on that same side. With my right arm high, I'm going to step back with my right leg to try and drop that right hip downward. And then from here, if you have a wall that you can take your other hand onto, you can gently push off that wall so that you push your body away and in the direction of the stretch and then relax. And then lengthen that out and relax. So from a front view, holding on to something here, same side leg stepping back, opposite leg forward and pushing 
away, gently back and forth to try and open up the tissue that comes down the side of your body. And if you did the symptomatic side, say it was your right elbow and you just lengthened out the right side of your body, check out that elbow and see how it's feeling. It may not be that we need to lengthen that side out. It could be the other side that really favors length. So we could take that left arm over holding onto something, having my right leg forward, my left leg back, and taking the other hand and pushing away. And just getting a little bit of length down the side of my body there. You do that for maybe 30 seconds to a minute and then assess, reassess. What does that feel like? So far, so good. I've got maybe three or four more movements and then we'll check in with everybody and see how things are doing. So we just worked on the biggest muscle of the upper body connecting the lower back to the arm. But now we're going to work on the muscle that connects the legs to the lower back. Again, from a structural perspective, very important. If there are some imbalances going on there, it could affect how the hips are positioned, which in turn would affect how the ribs are positioned, the shoulders positioned, and affect the elbow. So I'm gonna need a chair. And I'm gonna put it right out in front. And what I'll be doing is I'm going to place one foot upon the seat of the chair and I'm carefully going to lower myself down so that my knee can rest on the ground. Now, unfortunately, we'll see that there's black on black here, but my knee is directly underneath my hip. My foot's on the chair, so the knee, you may need a pillow or a pad just for comfort, is resting on the ground. What I'm going to try and do is maintain a nice tall posture over the knee that's on the floor. And while in this position, I'm going to encourage my tailbone to just gently pull downward to try to level off my pelvis so that it's not tilted forward, but it's just nice and level. You may feel a significant stretch down the front portion of that thigh of the knee that's down. Chances are you are. From here, you're just going to take the same side arm and you're going to reach up to the ceiling. And you're not only reaching up with the hand, but you're reaching with the elbow, you're reaching with the shoulder, you're reaching with the rib cage to try to lengthen out that entire side. And you can simply hold it here or you can make a dynamic where you're reaching up and down while getting that stretch most likely you're going to feel a significant more effect on the muscle tissue around the thigh and the hip when reaching upward. And then simply come on out of there and you can reassess the elbows to make sure that that had some effect or not. And then we can switch to the other leg, dropping that down, leveling off the pelvis, taking the arm up, lifting with the hand, lifting with the elbow, lifting with the shoulder. Everything on this side is lifting off of this hip while it is lengthening through the front. You could gently work on a little rotation, such as bringing the arm back, if you want to achieve a little bit more. Any of those mov motions are going to be probably beneficial just to getting the body to open up. If you feel this in your lower back, check in. Are you getting that tailbone to tuck down? It may be that you're so restricted and so uh, shortened in this tissue that it's not willing to open up in this position. And you may want to take that foot that's on the chair and just place it on the ground for the time being. And you can always get objects to build up to the height eventually of the chair. But if you are feeling in your lower back, that's most likely the problem. So make it a little bit easier, more manageable, allow an invitation for those muscles surrounding the hips and thighs to actually relax and release. Okay, so that's the hip flexors. And I know there's quite a few people who say, well, what does that have to do with my elbow? I think we've explained it, but you may be surprised that your elbow might feel better actually just by opening up the hips. It has been known to happen. So we've got the front of the hips. Let's work on the back side of the legs and hips. More to the point, the hamstrings. 
So what we're gonna have you do is we're gonna use the chair once again. And this time I'll use the seat back as well as the seat. And I'm going to place my left leg up on the chair. I'm going to turn the chair around this way. Left leg on the chair, how about here? And with my right hand just resting on the seat back. My left foot that's on the chair, I'm going to encourage it to pull toward me and flex the ankle, which will encourage my knee to also extend and straighten out. So pulling that foot back extends this knee and you'll feel how that tissue on the back of the knee and thigh are lengthening out. Uh, what we're gonna do also with the tailbone is we're gonna encourage it to tuck under. We don't wanna roll the pelvis on top like many of you have been told when stretching the hamstring. The hamstring never behaves in the real world when the leg is straight, the pelvis never tilts forward. So we're not going to go there because that feels nasty and burning. We're going to lengthen the hamstring in the, the, in the way it was designed to lengthen. So when the pelvis tucks under, the leg swings forward and the foot is getting ready to strike the ground by flexing upward. So in this position, I'm just going to encourage you to take your left hand and kind of reach forward and in the direction of the seat back a little bit to your right. Now the hand itself is not necessarily going to move anywhere from here but I am going to push my rib cage and my hips back behind me, and then I'm gonna come back up again. So I'm not reaching with my arm in this fashion. I'm keeping my hand here, and the reach is occurring because I'm drawing my body back behind me and then coming back up. So I will need to bend a little bit into the knee that I'm standing on the leg that I'm standing on, and I'm pushing the back of my spine and rib cage behind me as I keep that foot flexed. And that should present a much different sensation on the muscle tissue on the back of the leg. After you've done that side, check in with the elbow. Reassess. Kind of weird, but how the heck does that happen? That maybe stretching out my, the back of my leg has made my elbow feel better. And then we just go to the same thing on the opposite foot. So with the leg resting on the chair and feeling the weight of my leg, 20, 30, whatever pounds it is, feeling that resting on the chair, I pull my toe back. I'm gonna take the same side arm, have it forward, and I'm gonna kind of reach forward, but at the same time, I'm reaching back. Pushing the hips back. Pushing the spine and rib cage back. And really just sinking into that, maybe about five or six times or so. And then coming back up again. Okay, and then we'll finish with that opposing joint relationship theory where I was talking about earlier, where the elbow and the opposite knee have this millions of year old relationships. So we're going to take the knee, and I apologize for the black on black. Maybe I can go right here. We're going to take the knee so that the foot is off the ground, and you're going to make circles. Try to keep your thigh as still as possible. And the knee itself is like a pendulum. So if it is the right knee that is troubling, the right elbow that's troubling you, try the left knee. Do about six to 10 circles in one direction, six to 10 in the other, trying to keep the thigh still and just swinging that knee underneath you. Then check in with your elbow. You can do the same thing on the opposite knee. There's no rules here. It could be the same side knee that troubles you. We'll see. The other way that we can work the knees is by keeping the feet on the ground and making knee circles. So my hands I have placed on the top of my knees. I'm going to straighten out my legs when I get to the back. And then I'm going to sweep them around and in front and across to the other side before straightening once again. And we're just going to work on knee circles to stimulate the nerves in those joint capsules maybe about five or six in each direction. And then check in with the elbow after that. There's a whole bunch of other move motions and there's, everyone's got a unique reason as to why you are having some suffering going on in your elbow. It doesn't mean that uh, the problem is your elbow. 
Now, you're welcome to type up any notes or, I mean, we're at the end of it right now. Why, so one question is, why do you curl your body in posterior pelvic tilt when you stretch the hamstrings? Do you wanna stretch the whole back chain? All right, so the question is, when we were doing that movement with your foot on the chair and reaching forward, I'm mimicking what should and exaggerating what should occur in normal human gait when we walk, which is the most common means of locomotion for humans that we've been doing for over 2 million years. And so, the hamstrings themselves are muscles that will lengthen when both ends move in the same direction, only one at a faster speed than the other. And this occurs when the foot is on the chair. We posteriorly tilt the pelvis to allow the underside of the pelvis to move in the same direction the knee is moving or the tibia is moving. So we posteriorly tilt the pelvis so that we encourage the proper loading and lengthening of the hamstrings. I'm not in really trying to stretch the hamstrings out. A stretch sometimes refers to just taking both ends of the muscle and driving them apart. The hamstrings never behave that way when we're walking, running, skipping, or jumping. They are always lengthening by doing this, shortening by doing this. So that's why we posteriorly tilt the pelvis. We just want to be sure that not all of the length is coming from the spine. We want it to be kind of equal along that back chain, like you're wondering. So yes, we're trying to get length somewhat through the back chain, but more often than not, people will have more length than say the thoracic and mid back and less in the lower back, more in the glutes, less in the hamstrings, and almost like they flip where the thoracics are lengthened, the lumbars are shortened, the glutes are lengthened, the hamstrings are shortened. So what we're trying to do is create this, this kind of nice orchestration of lengthening through the chain when, when necessary. So hopefully I answered that question. Oh, okay. So the question is, things to do to strengthen and stabilize the elbow. Hmm. That's tricky. That's, that's really interesting. So strengthening the elbow, meaning most likely meaning the muscles surrounding the elbow, right? Um, is it that they're weak or is it they're, they're weak because they're overworked? Are they underutilized or overutilized? That's really the question. So if the muscles are underutilized, then pressing and pulling in three-dimensional space would probably be a good place to start. And, and finding novel means of movement, being a martial artist yourself, you know that it's more than just simple paths of motion, but getting you to have novel areas and finding where your weak spots are, exposing them for what they are and tapping into those movements to try to create strength would be very good. Uh, crawling, I could see potentially being uh, a way of creating dynamic stability. Yogic poses such as upward dog and downward dog may be places in which we feed stability through while the wrist and the shoulder are trying to position itself. Um, I, I would say those might be things to explore, but beware that if you have a complaining elbow, it's more often than not because it is overworked rather than underworked. And so then I would say, okay, where are the areas that are underworked? Uh, would it be, would it be the, I don't know, the, the rotator cuff muscles on the backside? Are they being lengthened and stretched out because the shoulder is forward? But there's a reason for that. So it's rather difficult to answer the question with just here are the exercises you should do. It really depends upon the person. What is your grip strength like? I might want to check that. I might want to check what is the com connection between your right arm and your left leg or your left arm and your right leg? Is there an imbalance between these contralateral relationships? And then can I feed into that? I might go there. It's more multi-joint or more in integrated of an approach, I guess. So repetitive strain from joint locks. Ah, okay. Repetitive strain from joint locks. So therefore, if the joint lock is while the elbow is flexed, 
I would work on things that you can do while the arms extended. If the joint lock and repetition is when the arms extended, I would work into close combat with the arm flexed. Think of opposites. So whatever you have a tendency to favor repetitively, see if we can do just the opposite of that. I know that the further out I reach with my body and the further my body goes, the more my nervous system lights up to prevent me from collapsing. So that's where we get the majority of muscle involvement. So can you work on really going out to this sphere, this invisible bubble in which we live and explore what it's like to encourage the arm to reach in all these different directions, incorporating the hips and the legs? That may be somewhere to go. Yeah, hopefully these are some, some tools that you can use. Obviously, you know, massage, chiropractic, those type of things, acupuncture, uh, those are very helpful and, and could be very helpful because they are all about realigning the body and bringing the body back into a more balanced point, which is exactly what we were trying to do with these movements, realign your body, bring it back to a more balanced point. So everything starts to uh, work the way it should. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Rockfit Files. Thanks for listening in. Hopefully you were able to follow along with those movements and make your elbows singing rather than screaming. We'll talk to you later.